We're going to read down to verse 1 of chapter 6, and we'll begin in <clears throat> verse 8 for establishing our context. Are you ready? Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that, call, that obey him. Called of God and high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let's go on again, I'll go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, etc. I know the etc. isn't there, but that's verse 2. Let's pray. Father, please, please help us to this evening with focus, understanding, <clears throat> application, and most of all, with having tender hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is a loaded text, and I'm not talking about loaded in the sense that it's one of those you know, powder kegs that could explode on you and be out of hand. I mean loaded in the sense that it is just loaded with truths that are just instrumental keys. Like they're the kind of truths that are steps in growth kind of truths. There are steps in the Christian life that, if not made, become actual hindrances for spiritual growth. For instance, baptism would be the easiest one to explain for a person that uh, is wondering, why is it that I'm not growing? Why is it I'm not moving forward? Well, if a believer gets saved and doesn't right away, or at least at some time, get baptized, then what you find is that they can grow but it's a hindrance to their growth because there's something important about openly proclaiming Jesus Christ. Amen. And baptism does that. And on the day of Pentecost, when the believers who had just previously screamed out, crucify him about Jesus, went down to the river and got baptized in the name of Jesus, there was a real statement made about what they believed. And there was a real step made in their lives, delineating, making lines, showing this is where I stand, this is the direction that I'm going. And for any believer that doesn't get baptized, the same is also true. It's just, well, I'm saved, I'm born again, but when you don't take those important steps moving forward in the faith, then the result is, come on, Tim, we're uh, in uh, Hebrews 5. Uh, when you don't take those steps, then the end result is that you never get beyond the basics and it's like you just don't get past that and you wonder sometimes, why don't I want to grow? You ever just feel like, well, I know I should about anything, but I don't want to? That's why I feel about cutting the grass every week. <laughs> you may relate to that. I know I should, but I don't want to. And I, sometimes you have to do things you just don't want to do. Uh, sometimes, though, you want to do things. You know, if you ever get good grass and, and you're able to cut it and it looks beautiful when you're finished and done, it's a little bit rewarding. There's some, maybe not grass for some people, not so much for me for sure, but there are some things that, you know, you, you do that you'd enjoy if you got around to doing them, but you just don't have the desire to do them. And spiritual growth is that way in many cases. And sometimes we want to grow spiritually. We want to prioritize it. We make it a matter of priority in our lives, and then sometimes we don't. Well, here in our text this evening, there are just several keys that show us steps, things that if you comprehend or if you practice, will help you with spiritual growth. It really is this passage of Scripture is putting its finger on a problem that the Hebrew Christians have. One of the reasons why they're falling away, one of the reasons why they're going back into Judaism, and one of the reasons really is that they just haven't taken the steps that they need to in order to grow. Now, last week we got ahead, we went ahead and skipped this, this little excursion that the Holy Spirit goes on here explaining what your problem is and gives a warning about not dealing with the problem. 
and we dealt with Melchizedek and the priest that Jesus Christ is after the order of. And one of the things that we clearly saw was that Melchizedek was superior, a superior priest to a Levitical priest. If you go back into Judaism, you'll go back to a priest that is from the tribe of Levi and is qualified because he's a Levite to be the priest. And the priest is qualified, a Levite, to receive tithes. But we saw last week that Melchizedek was superior to a Levite priest because Abraham paid his, him his tithes and because the seed was in his loins, that is, he was the grandfather of the Levites, uh, Abraham had the Levites in him. And if Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, then, he, then Melchizedek is greater than the Levites as far as a priest goes. And we're told Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. There are a lot of believers that believe that in the Old Testament, Melchizedek, or the king of Salem, he is a theophany, it's an appearance of Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't expressly state that. What the Bible does expressly state is that Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And here we're simply made to understand very, very plainly that Jesus is better than any priest in the Levitical system. Is that an understatement? Well, it is. About all of these encouraging statements in Hebrews are understated. And sometimes when you understate something, it, um, it kind of gives a little bit more attention to really the item than what your words could give. For instance, yesterday my dad and I went to the Lakeland Air Show, the, the uh, Sun and Fun Air Show, and I had never been to that before. But there, there were some planes flying. I've seen a lot of air shows. There were some, some P-51 Mustangs flying. I'll tell you, P-51 Mustang is an impressive plane until an F-16 F flies. <laughs> You know, and a P-51 roars by, an F-16 makes you cover your ears, you know, and kind of, it's kind of a little scary. And you think when an F-16 comes and then does a tiny <clears throat> turn over the crowd, you think, man, if that thing, if something goes wrong there, everybody's dead, you know. So if I were to make the statement, an F-16 is greater than a P-51 Mustang. It's an understatement, actually, isn't it? A P-51 is beautiful. It's probably more valuable today, they're all about $2 million airplanes, probably more valuable than a, and than even the later fighters, uh, just because I guess it's a classic and it's uh, iconic and all those things. But man, I'll tell you what, if we're going to go to battle, I want, I want F-16s or I want the later fighter jets, not a P-51. It's not our statement. See what I'm saying? Okay, so when we say Jesus is better than something here, we compare Jesus to angels. We compare Jesus to Moses. We compare Jesus to whatever. It's really emphasizing the reality that you're settling for, I don't want to use the word garbage, but you're settling for something that can't compare with what you have in Jesus Christ. You know, that's just true for us when we're away from the Lord, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're settling for something which can't compare with victory, that can't compare with fellowship, can't compare with eternal hope, can't compare with all the things that are benefits of having Jesus as our high priest. Understatement. So let's look at some some, uh, some statements. Verse 9 of chapter 5. We see, being made perfect, uh, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now there's some words for the word perfect in your Bible, some, some underlying meanings in the words. And the idea of perfect here is not only just a full completion uh, word, but it's kind of surprising that the word being made, or the, that the phrase being made perfect is used in reference to Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's surprising to me. Sometimes we ask the question, why did Jesus come? Uh, well, what did Jesus come for? To die on the cross for sins. Okay, why did it take so long? The time was not right. Well, prophecy, right? The prophecy for the, for the death of Christ. Okay, that could be. Okay, but, I mean, God knew all that in advance. Why didn't He adjust the timing a little bit and speed things up? Why did it take about 33 years? You know, we have this whole thing of, well, you know, you're not considered a man in, in uh, Israel and or in Jewish culture until you're 30 and so forth. But the Bible doesn't really say that. Third, <clears throat> when you were 30, you became uh, an adult. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Where does the Bible say that? Mm. It does. It does? You can find it in the Tanakh. 
but you won't find it. You won't find it in. Uh, it was twenty to fifty the people that were counted as adults in the uh, when they were wandering in the desert. Those were the ones that had to die before they could enter the promised land. Well, okay, so that would be that would be an example of ones that were not innocent. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the age, the or the people that were born ten and under and so forth. But, but also those are the ones that served in the military from twenty well, to fifty. We could yeah we could look at precedent for what was done, <clears throat> but honestly, scripture doesn't say you became an adult at thirty, and that's why Jesus took thirty three years. Uh, how, how effective was Jesus at 12 in doing the will of his Father? Did he command the respect of the people in the temple at 12? Every bit as much as he did as an adult. Okay. Jesus could have been the exception, couldn't he, to any cultural tradition that the Jews had. So I, I don't think that's why. And really the answer, the answer is in our text this evening. There are things that Christ must do and suffer in order to be obedient to the will of the Father. And also, as we're going to see further on, or actually we saw in chapter 4, in order to be able to identify Himself with us. In other words, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Without the temptation of Christ, there would not have been the victory over sin in its completion. In other words, we could say, well, you know, we ask this, does Jesus care? You know, we talk about, you know, when we're struggling with uh, sin and struggling with things. Well, it could, does Jesus know about that? And the answer is, yeah, 33 years worth. And in the day, obviously, if you look at the life expectancy, 33 years was, you were an elder at 30. At 30 in the day. You say, you're an elder as in, old. yeah, you were actually old at 30. You know, you look back in near American history and somebody my age is not expected to have a lot left as far as life goes and living goes and so forth. And, and some of y'all have way exceeded expectations. <laughs> so the reality of it is that the reason Jesus took the time that he did is because it was in order to relate to us. Remember this and never forget it. You're special because God knows your name and God loves you and God sent His Son to die on the cross for you. And you're special because Jesus died in particular for your sin. You're special because of the investment of the value of the blood of Jesus Christ. You're special because of that. But you're not special because you're the only one who's ever gone through it. Do you hear me tonight? You're special because of all those other reasons, but you're not special because you're the only one and nobody else has ever gone through this and no one else has ever experienced this. Jesus has. And chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10 are emphasizing that when Jesus went to the cross, He was finished living. He was finished with life. He had, he had been through everything in order to perfectly... Uh, look at verse 8. Though He were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. Now the word perfect here is not the word for sinless. It means complete, finished. And so until that time, until Jesus had exemplified obedience. Now, we're, not, we're also not teaching that Jesus learned obedience versus disobedience, right? Jesus is not, well, you know what, we've got to correct some bad behavior until he becomes perfect. It's not that at all. No, he was God's perfect son. But he hadn't obeyed in everything because he hadn't had the time to obey in everything. And that's the emphasis here, is that Jesus was God's perfect son who perfectly did everything. So why? Why 33 years? Well, you can hang uh, traditional teaching as far as the reason why. Here's the answer right here. Verses 8 through 10. Because this is Jesus learning obedience for the Father and completing finishing the work on the cross. So when Jesus said, it is finished, <clears throat> He was not referring to the passion and His life as far as, okay, I finished dying. No, He's saying, I finished living in flesh and being tempted. Now, you might want to meditate on that a little bit because it's pretty loaded. But when Jesus said, it's finished, He's saying, I finished the work. Everything God sent me to do is finished. And so it wasn't a, oh, finally I get to stop suffering. 
on the cross. No, it's, I'm done with everything that I came to do, and it's a triumphant statement. It's a statement of great triumph. It's not an escape statement. It's not like, okay, time up, I can quit. It's a, I'm done. I finished it all. And that's what the author of Hebrews is emphasizing here. Okay, we know in verse 10, he's an order called a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's look at the matter of teachers. Get this one, because uh, this is one you, um, you might not like, but you need to meditate on, and it'll be a step in your life if you let God work this out in your life. In verse 11 about Melchizedek, he said, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're a doll of hearing. It's hard to say things to people that aren't listening. Right? <coughs> Sometimes I pray before I preach, God help people be awake tonight. That way I don't fall asleep while I preach to them. Now, it's just hard to communicate with people that aren't communicating back. You communicate, don't you? I've had people trying to communicate with me when I'm preaching before. You know, casting angry glances at me or huffing or glaring or looking up or looking down or, you know, or shaking their heads or whatever as they communicate. And that's all very, very uh, much a part of communicating. But dull of hearing <laughs> is not a complimentary statement. A pastor is supposed to also be a teacher. You just do a study in the Scripture, you see a pastor is supposed to be a teacher. And believers are supposed to be a teacher. And some years ago, I realized it doesn't matter an iota if I lay out the information if people don't learn it. In other words, a good teacher gets the students taught. A good teacher then teaches, right? Uh, you know, I, I've, been, I've been in classes, and perhaps some of you have, where the professors say they give you the, the syllabus at the beginning, they give you the course outline, they give you all the things that they expect of you in the, in the class, and they're going to give you what you need in order to be able to pass the class, but it's up to you whether or not you pass. In other words, if you decide you're not going to do the projects, or you're not going to pay attention in class, or you're not going to study, you're not going to do what they require, they're just fine just failing you. Right? Well, I don't take a class for a grade, and you shouldn't either. I don't think anybody ought to take a class just to get it to earn uh, a grade or even a degree. I take a class to learn. But some teachers say, well, I put the material out there. I told them what was expected of them, and I taught the class. If they got it, then good. And if they didn't get it, then too bad. But you know, a teacher, I'm not talking about you know a school teacher, but I'm talking about a Christian teacher, a spiritual teacher, who's supposed to teach others. He's got to teach people. And he's got to figure out how to teach them sometimes. If people aren't listening, he's got to learn how to get their attention, get them to listen. Got to figure out what makes them tick. Different people learn different ways, don't they? Mm -hmm. How many of y'all are visual? How many of y'all wish this evening I had visual aids for teaching? Yeah, a lot of y'all are that way. I am not a visual. I, I just I don't need the visual. I'm a book guy. I, you you lay it out for me in text and in print, and I I visualize it in my mind. I don't like when other. I just don't like when people visualize things. Same reason I hate it when somebody takes a good classic book and turns it into a movie. They just wreck my visual of it. And I don't want that. But some people, why? Well, I just can't visualize what you're saying. They want a visual. You know what I'm saying? Well, you know, if you're a good teacher and people need visuals, you've got to help people visualize things, don't you? And so we see here in our context this evening, though, that there's a statement made about Melchizedek. And it's interesting, the author of Hebrews does explain what he's saying about Melchizedek. But he says it's really hard to explain this to you because you're not very good at listening. It's, it's difficult to understand the things I'm trying to tell you because you're dull of hearing. In other words, he very, very kindly says, you're too dumb to get this. Now, the reason they're... They, but the way he says it isn't that they lack the intellectual capability. It's because they lack ears to hear. Their hearing is dulled. And it's because of their spiritual condition that's dulled their hearing. Okay? Now he goes on to say something that I find convicting. See, some of the message in 
Hebrews chapter 5 is to people who aren't here tonight, isn't it? I mean, what's Hebrews written for? It's written to urge believers who are really not going forward in their faith with Jesus Christ and have even faith forsaken other believers and are no longer fellowshipping with believers and growing in their faith. They're not reading their Bibles. They're not going to church. They're not fellowshipping with other believers. They're not encouraging other Christians. Well, you know something? The message this evening will work real well for them, but what's the problem? Huh? They're not here. Don't you hate it when preacher just goes off on you like you're the one? That uh, Well, that part of the message isn't really for you here this evening. Because we're, we're not preaching to people that aren't here. Uh, we're talking about people that aren't here to you. Now, it's always a warning for me. I don't want to be that. I don't want that to be me. And thank God. Thank God I'm ancient and I haven't gone back from following Jesus and from fellowshipping with believers and from growing and so forth. But it could happen to me and here's a warning here for me uh, that's part of it. But that's not really what we're going to take home this evening, are we? And by the way, I'm not lumping people that cannot be here this evening into a category of dull of hearing. In case you're wondering, Pastor Cobb said, anybody who didn't come, well, go ahead and say it. I'd like to feel the phone calls. Okay, Pastor says, anyone who's not here this evening is dull of hearing. Isn't what I said. And if you think, then never mind. Uh, <laughs> in uh, verse 12, though, there is a statement that's very important. This is a step. This is a step in spiritual growth for you, just like your baptism. When, but when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. I know people who have been born again and saved, and because they've gotten away from the Lord, or they've even gone back into their religion, they're asking questions that they knew the answer to when they got saved. You go back to the Catholic Church, you're going to you're going to engender questions eventually. Well, they say this. So how about that? You know, when you're when you're reading the word of God, when you're growing spiritually and where you're where you're ought to be, you just don't have any questions about Catholicism. Well, they say this, but well, you know what the Bible says, so you, you know the how about that. But when you get away from it, you kind of forget how you're saved. And you're like, well, you know, they kind of there's a little bit of merit to the whole Mary thing. You know, there's a little bit of what it, when you get into going back, you get to be dull of hearing, and sometimes you get to be where you need to. Okay, let's look at the Bible and let's see what what is required for salvation. You have to go back and learn some things that you ought to just know. You ought to be settled on, but because of where you're at, you've actually sown doubt in your heart. Uh, sermon samplers, church hoppers. Boy, they get confused about a lot of things. And you're just like, well, you know, I don't know about the whole Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And like, well, I'll tell you, the Bible's really clear about it. But if you go to a church that teaches false doctrine, you'll be influenced by it to some degree. It'll affect you to some degree, and you're going to have questions, and you're going to have doubts about truth. And so there's a, that's one of the dangers in going back. And then there's the other application, and that is that we ought to be teachers. You say, yeah, Pastor, you really should. You should be a better teacher. Well, I'm going to agree with you on that on both counts. I'm always happy, by the way, to hear criti criticism, uh, whether with a good spirit or a bad spirit, to be quite honest with you. Bad spirit of criticism always makes me laugh. Uh, or, you know, when somebody's mean, like just really, really mean, I don't know why, but it just appeals to my sense of humor a little bit. So I appreciate that kind of criticism as, uh, as well as how much truth is in it and help I can have. Uh, but good spirit of criticism is really a help. When somebody says, you know, Pastor, one time you did a good job, and this is what you did. <laughs> you know, and uh, this really was a help to me. Or this, this is really offensive, and you may not even be aware of this. Or, you know, this is really unclear, and this could be a help. Well, that's always a help to me. And sometimes, and I, I don't, uh, I'm not talking about, well, you know, I just don't know what to do in life, and I need you to come up with a list for me. 
and help me figure out how to spend my time and how to be a pastor and so forth. I'm talking about just good criticism or maybe something that's just not right or something that's troublesome, that sort of thing. It's always a help to me. Because I ought to be a good teacher as a pastor. But so should you. See, that's what the Holy Spirit's saying. There's an inclusive statement here. We're not preaching to backslidden pastors here. We're talking to backslidden believers at large in general. And every Christian ought to be a teacher. And you say, Pastor, who could I teach? Well, let me help you with something. You realize that you're uniquely equipped to reach the people that are around you. And you're actually uniquely equipped to reach believers in the church as well. In other words, I just have noticed when I study the Scripture that God wants all believers to preach the Gospel and God wants every believer to be a teacher. And I'm talking about the person sitting in your seat. God wants you to be a teacher. You say, Pastor, a Sunday school teacher? Sure. Sure. A Sunday school is the place, one of the places where we really do a lot of teaching. But you know, most of you all aren't aware of this, but almost every single Friday, I meet with people and teach them one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, I just meet with their several people, uh, usually about three people all the time that I'm meeting with, one-on-one -on -one and teaching. And, you know, that's probably the kind of teacher that's most effective. I found that my one-on-one -on -one teaching is the most effective teaching of any kind of teaching that I do. And that's probably more what we ought to be, as believers, really focused toward. Uh, not just one person, but one-on-one. -on -one. Do you realize that you can relate to people's... Uh, you say, Pastor, I've only been saved a year. Or I've only been saved 30 years, or I've only been growing. You know, how long have you been growing for this long? Do you realize that you've been growing a lot longer than somebody else who hasn't grown at all, or somebody who's been saved not as long as you have? But you also have a much fresher perspective on what needs to be taught than I do. It's tough for me. I, the thing that helps me the most is teaching, and the one on one teaching because I get to spend a, time, a lot of time listening to questions, fielding questions. It helps me, but you know, I can't relate very well to somebody who's a new believer and what they're learning. It's just not something that I'm a very good uh, that I'm very good at relating to because I've been saved since I was four years old. I grew up in a Christian home. I didn't really have a different perspective or worldview. I looked at other worldviews and decided I had the right one when I was a teenager. And so I, I really did not coming from this is what people need to know or what people don't know as much as many of you are. And so you could be a much more effective teacher than I can just because of a fresher perspective or having been having learned some of the things. Man, there are so many basic foundational things this is a struggle as a preacher, is preaching and knowing your audience. You know, different churches have different levels of maturity, right? My preference would be in a church full of newly saved people. If I got to be in a place where I want to be, I want to have not everybody, but a lot of the people be newly saved. But you know, it just goes right over my head what words newly saved people don't know what they mean. It goes right over my head what concepts they've never been taught. And I'll be teaching something that, that that concept would be a foundation for, except there's been no foundation. And so I'm talking about something and somebody's here. And it's like it's like going into Algebra 2 without <clears throat> taking Algebra 1. Mm. You ever, ever done that? Mm. I got transferred. I got switched up my math curriculum. I switched schools halfway through my sophomore year. Went from uh, a back of curriculum to Saxon math. And I'll tell you, it was just like... Whoosh. They were using terms that I'd never heard. Different type of math or different... Uh, the curriculum use different terminology. And I'm sitting in class going, I'm never going to pass this class. I have not a clue what's going on here. I was an A student. But I didn't know the terminology. I didn't know what they were talking about. And a good teacher helped me with that. Helped me figure out what I knew, what I didn't know, and learn some things, explain some things, and pretty soon I was up to speed and doing just fine. And that's what a good teacher ought to do. And you know, you could be good at that. Sometimes for people to say, you know, Pastor, this is what people think you mean. It's what people think you said. Or uh, explain to a person, you know, this is what this means. And you've just got a fresher perspective. But you know, everybody ought to be a teacher. And the level of teacher you should be ought to be at the level where you're at. Uh, so we're not talking about grades here, are we? We know that spiritual growth is not the same as child development. Uh, <laughs> spiritual development is completely different. It's, it's a choice wants to grow. For instance, we know, don't we, Josiah, that doing push-ups makes you taller? 
scientific fact. Everybody knows done push-ups has gotten taller. And so that's a fact. We know that putting peanut butter... Yeah, put, yeah, see? You didn't do enough push-ups. <laughs> uh, we know that putting peanut butter on your lip will help you grow a better mustache. And so those are just they're scientifically proven facts by, that are done by the science of observation. And everybody we've ever observed that has done that has uh, been successful in those things. Well, <laughs> the fact is that spiritual growth is not... It's one of those things where you do things by choice, isn't it? Spiritual growth is something where if I do the things that I need to do in order to grow, you know, if I deal with sin in my life, that will stop me from being hindered in growth. If I get in the Word of God and I work on learning truths and concepts, that will help me with my spiritual growth. And if I fellowship with God and if I put to practice the things that I need to practice, I'll grow. And do you know something this evening? I'm going to tell you something that if you haven't done it, you won't know, but be, being a teacher will be a major step in your spiritual growth. There's a big difference between someone who actually summons up the courage to say, well, let me just show you something here. And I'm not talking about a title like, you know, I have a class. Although that's, that's important. That's fine. I'm talking about a person that actually teaches the things they know to people that don't know them. It's incredible how you can teach your neighbors that are maybe Christian or maybe don't know if they're saved or not because they don't have clear doctrinal truth. But you know, i found that I teach people all the time. Nearly every time somebody inquires as to my occupation and they find out that I work for the church and I'm a pastor, they start asking me questions about things they wonder about. And I have the chance to explain them to them. And you know, as soon as people find out that you're a believer, they do the same thing, don't they? Do you really believe, you know what that is? It's an opportunity for you to teach. Do you really believe that whatever, whatever, whatever? Yeah, I do, and here's why. And so you have an opportunity to teach. And we as believers are supposed to be teaching and not being the do you really believe questioners. You see what I'm saying? We're talking about, we're talking about matters of faith. Okay, then we see a diagnostic here. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. That's verse 13. For he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you visualizers, look at these screens up here. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but I've got a picture of a uh, baby drinking milk and uh, over here, a man eating steak, okay? And the idea is babies drink milk, men eat steak. Amen. And if you are struggling with basic truths, the problem is not the truth. The problem is you've not gotten past. You haven't taken the stage of growth. And it's interesting that the scripture right before this uses a stage of growth example by whom? Who is our example of someone who grew and was perfected? Jesus. 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 Isn't that incredible? That's a great example, isn't it? So if Jesus needed to go through these things to be made perfect in order to be able to finish the work that he came to do, then he's a good example to us for growth, isn't he? And so, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, do some summary. They summarize the, the things that people struggle with when they don't move on in their faith. When you don't move on your, in your faith, you have to go back and relearn the things that you've forgotten. When I went back to seminary, my goal was that I was going to nail down my languages. I, my, my goal, what I wanted to do, was because I had to go in residence to get an MDiv, I wanted to get my, my Hebrew and my Greek to where I wouldn't forget everything I'd learned. You know, they say it's all Greek to, to me. What they mean is you don't know what it means. And when I went back to seminary, that was my goal. Was to, When I was in college, I was a biblical languages minor. And by the time I'd been out of school, uh, well, it had been my last year, my senior year, I don't think I'd had to take any biblical language courses. By the time I'd been out of school, like four years, I, I couldn't remember Greek. I didn't know much about the language. I just lost a lot. So I wanted to retain it when I went back. And so I went back in the second semester, and I didn't. I already had advanced credits in the language, but I didn't remember what I'd learned. So I jump in second semester of, of uh, second semester Greek, and the precedent for second semester Greek, of course, is first semester Greek. And so I jumped back in second semester 
and it's familiar, kind of. But I had to go home in order to be ready for the test the next day. I had to go home the first night. I think I studied probably five or six hours just to just to be ready for the test the next day. But there were a lot of just blanks in my mind. Like, I don't remember what this means or whatever. And so I really had to go back and relearn the whole first semester. I had to take my grammar book and teach myself the whole first semester and so that by the end of the semester I was up to speed. I started off working hard and making C's. I mean like really studying and getting a C on a quiz. And I wanted to get an A in the class and man it took me the whole semester to get to where you know I was okay this is you know but after that second year Greek was just a breeze. Why? Well because I didn't have to learn first year Greek. To take second year Greek I'd gotten up to speed. And then when you get into third year uh, you're doing all syntax. You're not learning the basic things like grammar. You're, you're just reviewing some basic things, but you're not learning those things. You're applying the things you've learned. And, you, you know, every class after that is just, well, it's just to use the things that we've learned. And once you get to that level, you don't have to relearn the basic things. But if you never get to third year level, you'll always forget first and second year because it won't have any meaning to you. It's amazing how the practice of an application of truth also brings understanding. Same is true with faith and obedience, isn't it? Does God ever show, does God ever just do the thing before you believe Him to do it? No. Faith and obedience always precede God's miraculous or God's promises, God's delivery on His promises. You don't say, well, God, show me and I'll obey. No, you obey and God will show you. And when God shows you, you say, well, that's, boy, that, I understand yeah, that now. That makes right. good sense. Yeah, so hey, we as believers, if we don't become teachers, do you see what the Scripture here is trying to help us understand? If we don't get to where we're teaching, if we don't get to that next step or that next level of our spiritual growth, we're just going to keep going through the same thing again. I'll tell you what, I don't want to go to kindergarten every year. Now, I appreciate that they have, you know, snack time where you get milk and a cookie, but... Uh, I want steak. You know, I want to get to go on the teen outing. You know, I want to I want to do some of the adult things, right? Spiritually speaking, and that's the illustration. Okay, <clears throat> I've gone too long, really, uh, this evening. And this passage of scripture is one that people who who snipe, that is, they grab this portion of the scripture from its context and they put it into a context where they're trying to explain how to be saved or how to remain saved, uh, develop false doctrine. The doctrine in particular, let's just read those verses. And I'll, I'll comment on it, and if I see too many puzzled looks, maybe we'll go back again here next week, but I'd like to get beyond it, to be honest with you. The Bible says we're supposed to go beyond those things, leaving those things. And in verse 3, this will do if God permit. Then notice the warning <laughs> passage. Beginning in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Does that sound like somebody who's saved? Good. I'm glad we all agree. Let's move forward. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. You've even tasted eternity. In verse 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again to unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now here's what I've heard taught here before, and it's too bad because it isn't what the Scripture's teaching. I've heard people say that if you get saved and then you backslide or you get away from God, then ultimately it's impossible for you, uh, you'll, you'll be lost, and it'll be impossible for you to get saved again. And I've heard that taught. Well, actually what the Scripture's saying actually ought to be as plain as the nose on your face. It's impossible for Jesus who has completed the work of the cross to die again for sins, and to be crucified afresh. And so, it's really actually teaching the opposite of what many people teach. It's not teaching that you can lose your salvation. It's teaching that you can't get saved again. It's teaching that, you know, if you've tasted of the heavenly gift, you've tasted of the Holy Ghost, you've had all these things, God's done all these things, it's impossible to renew you again to repentance. It's talking about for salvation, uh, seeing, you know, you, you've crucified Christ afresh, and Put him to an open shame. In other words, Jesus is not going to go to the cross again because when he said it is finished, it was done. <clears throat> so you can't redo a work that is finally done and Jesus isn't going to die again. But that's the visual that you're using. When every time you backslide, you get saved again. 
Every time, oh, you know what, I think the problem was I, I thought I was saved, but I really wasn't. And now I'm, I'm going to ask Jesus uh, to save me. What you're doing is you are calling the work of the cross incomplete and making Jesus have to die again visually, but it's not possible to actually do that because Jesus died how many times? Once for all. Okay, that's the first part of the illustration. And the reason that's given is that you can't crucify Jesus afresh. You can't do it. It's impossible to do that. It's not saying it's impossible to repent. It's not saying it's impossible to get saved. It's impossible to be resaved. So you go back to the basic doctrines and you think that your problem with your sin or your fellowship or your backsliding is you need to get saved, you need to get baptized, and you need to learn the basic doctrines, repentance from, uh, the, uh, uh, from dead works and faith toward God. No. And then look at verse six, 7. For the earth which strengtheneth in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. Okay, well that's pretty plain, isn't it? God's saying He blesses good ground. Isn't that what it's saying? Verse 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. <clears throat> and notice the next phrase, because this debunks entirely the theory of people who try to make this, gospel, this about the gospel. And the Bible says, That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Now let me ask you a question. Does it say, and is cursed, or does it say, is nigh unto cursing? There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between being satanic and being turned over to Satan. Do you see the difference? In other words, when, you know, when a believer backslides and he's turned over to Satan, he won't get right with God. He won't get in fellowship with others. He's been warned. And because he is supposed to have be really frightened back into fellowship with God, he's turned over to Satan uh, for the destruction of his flesh. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 briefly, would you please? Because it's very much a similar uh, passage of Scripture. And it's talking about works. Uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians chapter 3. Did I say 2 Corinthians? No, no you said 1 Corinthians. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, according to the grace of God, this is verse 10, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. And, we, and I don't have time to preach 1 Corinthians. Hopefully you remember the theme of it. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now let's talk about what's the foundation that Jesus laid. It's a church, but, but ultimately it's our salvation, right? Look at the illustration. Now, if any man built upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. So we see that the building is works, right? The works that a person does. And you can build on the foundation, which is your <coughs> salvation. You can build wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. Then the Bible says that every man's work shall be made manifest. Manifest is openly laid forth or shown forth in an apparent way. So every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Well, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Everything we've done is going to go into the fire, and the fire is going to burn everything that isn't gold, silver, precious stones. So if it's wood, air, stubble, burns. And then it says, uh, if any man's work be burned, verse 15, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In other words, he escapes by the skin of his teeth. In other words, his works don't make it, but he makes it and he's just a little bit singed, if you will. Mm -hmm. he's, he's just a little bit smoky. He made it with nothing to show for. And that's the same illustration that we find in Hebrews chapter 6. In other words, a person is nigh to uh, cursing whose end is to be burned. He's just nearly himself burned. He's nearly singed. The word nigh is nearly, almost, near to, but it's not all the way there. And this is what it is for a believer who... <coughs> doesn't go forward in their faith. Same theme as we find in Ecclesiastes when Solomon tries to tell people that if you live life for the things that burn, you'll end up with nothing. It's all a vanity. <coughs> and you know, if you don't live for Jesus, friend, if, if you 
go back from fellowship with God, you go back into sin, you go back even into another religion, you'll escape. But you'll be smoky. That's the idea. You know, you, you're not going to have anything to show for. You're not going to have gold, silver, precious stones. And friend, you'll care when that day comes. You'll, come, you'll care when, the, when it's the judgment seat of Christ and your works are burned. You'll want to have some things make it out of the fire. It'll matter to you at that time. And so, even in this warning, we're warned, you can't go this route. You can't just leave Christ and come back to Christ. Because you can't ever really leave. Jesus Christ isn't going to be crucified again on the cross. And every time you call on the name of the Lord for salvation, it's like you're putting Jesus right back on the cross where you first met Him at. And my friend, Jesus has already left that behind. He's already finished the work. It's already once for all completed. And the Holy Spirit puts it this way, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. The Holy Spirit here said, But you know what? You're better than that, aren't you? You ever gotten a good lecture and you thought, Well, they think I'm terrible, and then at the end of the lecture they say, But... But that's not you, is it? You're not going to do that, are you? Beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. So, so don't, don't go that route. And we're just being warned then of what will happen. Friend, if you go away from following Jesus, everything that you do will be a waste of your life. And if you think that you can just uh, come back and get saved again the same way, it's not possible. Once saved, always saved. It's just a waste of your life. And the picture that you are depicting of the Lord Jesus is just like the thing that I despise the most in Catholicism, and that's a crucifix. you got Jesus still on the cross. Get Him off the cross. Because He's not there anymore and He's not going to die again. So Father, please help us to retain and absorb the things that we learned today and help us to learn to get beyond basics and become teachers. God, I would pray for each person here this evening that this would be a week where we would each have opportunity to actually teach some of the things we've learned. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I realized this evening that I didn't answer all the questions you could have. This is, as I said before, a loaded text in that it has a lot in it. If you've got questions, come ask the questions and we'll look at it. But I will say this, this is very, very much like any so-called problem passage in the scripture where if you keep on reading you'll see the answer to your question or you'll see the clarification for what you thought it said and the reason for that is because it's one of those texts that people like to just grab and then put into their theological system and proof text with it instead of just look at it for what it's saying remember the context of Hebrews would you please is Hebrews explaining to lost people how to be saved or is it explaining to save people why it's important for them not to go back and to go on in their faith. Context is everything in Hebrews, isn't it? Okay, right, let's go ahead and take some prayer requests this evening. I know we have quite a few. Okay. Pray for